Hello, my name is Anna. I'm a user experience and design consultant at Google. I hope you're all enjoying the amazing presentation. I saw the schedule on the website. It looks really, really good. And unfortunately, I couldn't attend the other talks, but I will definitely watch them all online. I just arrived from Budapest, where I had another event yesterday. It's actually my second time in Munich. The last time I've been here was really far ago, and I was a student traveling around Europe. So forgive me, I don't remember it that well. But I do hope I will enjoy the city this time. My talk is called How to Succeed in Mobile Web, because my job is I'm helping different companies to improve user experience and conversion rates in their mobile websites. In my team, we focus specifically on mobile web, because that's the area where we recognize companies are really struggling with in terms of conversion rates or any other KPIs and metrics that you are looking at, if you, for example, compare that to desktop conversions or app conversions. I will take you through some best practices and UX suggestions, right? Things that we saw work well in mobile websites that you can test. But besides things that you can test, the checklist of things, I will also speak a bit about things that you need to learn so that your A-B test is successful and how and why you also need to change the culture of your organization, the company you're working for, in order to succeed in mobile. I'm going to start with the first part from the test, and that's going to be the checklist of things that you can try on your websites. Some of these things we've learned from UX teams at Google, and some of these things we learned from external companies. Over the last four years, my team in Dublin has completed more than 600 UX projects, UX audits with different websites and companies of different industries. And I do want to talk about every one of them, but my four-hour request was declined. So I will take you for some of them, though, and I'm going to start with a story. This is a picture I took in one of the restaurants in London, where I've recently been. These are salt and pepper shakers that they brought me. And I did want some salt in my dish, and I didn't want any pepper. So I've made an assumption that salt is probably in the one with five holes. So just to let you guys know, in my culture, the salt shaker would have more holes than pepper. I, later on, while I was doing this talk, I figured out it's not the case everywhere. So I've made an assumption, I conducted experiments, and bam, this was pepper. And I was like, wow, what a brilliant example this is of when we design things. We may think things are clear, because they are clear to us, but this may not necessarily be the, be the case for every user. And that was in London, but then I went to Dublin, and this is what I saw in one of the pops, right? So here I had absolutely no chance to make any assumption. I just had to blindly do the thing in order to figure out where my salt is. And you know, I do travel a lot. I, when I travel from country to country, I find things quite, quite different. Very different. Inconsistent. And sometimes, like, weird. <laughs> Can you guess where this one was? OK, I'm not going to torture you. It's, oh, no, it's not the United States. I'm going to have some United States example, but later. This was Amsterdam. But so yeah, if you've ever been there, you may have seen these guys. So it's not only about number of holes, right? Sometimes people just want to be very creative and get crazy about designs. Like, for example, here. This is not mine. This is just I found it online. One lady in Belgium collects salt and pepper shakers. And I was like, wow, how crazy can people go for making things just beautiful and not usable at all? Because I would have no idea which ones of them are salt and which ones of them are pepper. So when you travel, you find yourself in all these different environments, and every time you need to adapt in order to figure out how things work. And what's useful here is to be able to recognize and recall things in order to get things done, right? It's like jumping from one website to another and trying to figure out how I can do things there. So the solution to the salt and pepper mystery is probably this. Right? Maybe not the best design, 
but definitely a better user experience. Which brings me to the first point that I have for all your websites that you design, is just call it what it does, what's going to happen. Whenever you have any icon on your website, just add a text label. Say what's going to happen. You cannot be clear enough and remember the salt and pepper thing. Right? Because every icon is a room for misinterpretation, and users may think, assume different things based on their different backgrounds. Right? And you may also think, like, oh, we don't have really space in mobile. But regarding space, I'll tell you more. It's if you do have just an icon without a text label, it's probably not large enough for mobile for our large fingers, you know, but if you add a text label, then you increase the overall tappable area and it actually, it kind of, it has more chances to meet the accessibility guidelines and standards. So just launch this test and see yourself. We did this, we learned this in our own Google products, and this is a case study that I'm happy to share from Google Translate team. They increased the number of engagements with features by just naming them in the UI. So I guess you know, everyone just was really wondering what was that weird snake on the screenshot before. But now everybody knows this is a handwriting feature that you can try. So just to conclude this text labels thing, this is another example that I saw the other day in Google Canteen in Tel Aviv, and it really made my day. I thought, like, how much time we usually spend next to the cutlery trying to pull things out in order to figure out where, where the fork and where the knife is. I thought it was genius who added these text labels. They just saved so much people's time and efforts. Okay, so remember about text labels? Just add them. Moving on to the next real-life example and the next thing that you can test in your websites. And I'm going to ask you, do you have any idea what's this? Besides the fact that this is a Walking Dead GIF. Well, this is a door, and it's a so-called revolving door, right? And originally, revolving doors that were invented as a design solution is it to allow much more people in and out. However, if you are a user of revolving door, so if you're in there, or if you're just about to enter this door, you're not really feeling good, do you? It, kind of, it moves really fast, you cannot control the speed, and you depend on other people you are in this door. So the revolving door represents zero user control and a lot of anxiety. And you know what it reminds me on websites? It reminds me animated carousels of banners that people put right on the top of the homepage, above the fold space, the, the most important space on your website. And of course, this is a bad user experience because it's a forced content exploration. It really moves fast, and we do perceive animation as ads, and we will ignore it, right? But even if I get interested in what's on the banner, it moves away from me. So, I still need to show you a website example, how you should not be doing this. And obviously, I cannot use any of your websites. Uh, I probably need to use some of our own mistakes that we are also making at Google. So this is a real website. This, if you check the Google Merchant Store, so just don't do these things, OK? It's obviously, you cannot get attracted by this animation. So if you do need to have these banners to keep them there, just switch off the animation, put the user in control, allow them to swipe, to click, to explore, because engagement is a new currency in the UX world, right? You kind of you put the user in control and you make this a user-initiated exploration. So that is a thing about the animated carousels. Just don't do them or switch off the animation. The next thing, and this is again, it's not mine, it's my friend who has a blog about his life in Ireland has found this on Reddit. As you can see, it's, it is very confusing. So um, 10 items will do at the checkout and 12 items will do too. But what if I have 11? <laughs> 
How do you phrase things? Are you leaving your user clear or confused about what they should do? Which brings me to the next thing, the copy, right? That you need to get done and get done in a really good way. And it's very, very hard, especially in mobile, because you need to keep things very short, but at the same time descriptive. Easy to understand for a child and obviously easy to translate to other languages because your website may be running in different countries. Right? There are many UX copywriting rules and you can find them all online. I will just focus on a few mistakes that some companies do and a few test types that you can run. One of the things that some companies do is they brag about their product or about their service, but they forget about the user, right? And instead of this, they should be speaking about the end user and what the better version of themselves the user is going to become if they use your product or your service. This is actually a very basic sales training about speaking about benefits and not features. Just remember that probably your users are not very technical in general and tell them what they can do, not what your product does. Okay? And again, this is a quite a basic sales thing. And just be friendly and polite. You don't you know, point out the mistake that they made. Be, um, just tell them in a nice and conversational way what they should do in order to fix that mistake that they probably didn't want to do. Stay on the light side. <laughs> don't really, you know, you don't need this kind of negativity in your life. Nobody needs that. So besides some, you know, basics of UX copywriting, what are the tests that you can do? Well, you definitely need to test things um, at the text labels on your call to actions. And this is a case study from Google search team that was um, announced last year at the Google I.O. So they used to have a text label book a room. And what they found was that um, this was actually too early for users to commit at this stage. They changed it to check availability and they realized that this was actually meeting users where they were in their journey. Uh, and the number of engagements has, with the call to action button has increased. Another thing that you can test besides the copy of the CTA text label is a copy of high level navigation items. Edgar's is a large omni channel fashion retailer in South Africa, one of the markets I'm working with. And they just changed, you know, a name of high level category in the menu from sale to deals. And what they found as a result of an A-B test that it final conversion, and I clarified this like with them, are you sure guys the final conversion has decreased? And they said yes. So even just such a small thing as a name of the high level category can impact the business metric that you're looking at. And it was a really good thing that they did and test and not a direct implementation of this thing. And they could see things themselves, so they rolled it back to the sale. And the last but not least about the copy is, what is testing different copy of your value propositions, right? The value proposition is a message that user would see when they come to their website for the first time and you really need to speak about like what are you offering and again speak about the end user, what they're going to get, why they should stay on this website and continue exploring the content. Kissmia.com is a dating website, and they had an idea to test what kind of message works best for people who come to their website for the first time, and the goal for them to, is to register. So I'm not sure how you guys, if you can read this well, but so they were comparing the easy way, serious dating, and find your love. Can you guess which one was the most successful? Yeah, you can hear some people say love. So yeah, at the end of the day, it's all about love. <laughs> the serious dating actually worked better than the easy way, but love won, right? So they, now they have to find your true love today. Do A-B test this, the value propositions. This is a very simple test, but you really need to get that message that works for your target audience, for your um, website design, and for your business model, right? 
And to, to conclude the copy section, I just want to say that sometimes it's not that evident what impact the language can have on the business. And you really need to run this test on the background in order to see things yourself. Moving on to the next thing, and sometimes when I travel, <laughs> I rent a car, and probably every driver here can recall a bad navigation example. It was really a confusing one. And navigation is a very, very complex area, especially in mobile, and I will speak oh, sorry, just about a few things, and specifically about mobile-first navigation and what it means for websites specifically. Can I ask you a question? Do you see any difference, or well, can you, there is a difference, can you spot any difference between these guys and these? Sorry? No, not the color. Yeah, it's the bar, it's the navigation bar. It's either on the top or in the bottom, right? So for all screenshots, on the top, it's on the bottom, so you got this. Um, and what if I now say that the first group is apps and the second one is websites? So why is this really happening, right? Apps, they are originally designed with mobile only user in mind, where websites, they get the top level navigation as a legacy from desktop. However, the bottom level navigation is actually considered to be more ergonomic location because if, for example, I hold my phone with just one hand, I do need to change the way I hold it in order to interact with the panel. So it, it, the key message here, it is a good a, an idea for a test in mobile. However, the, the question here is that when all websites will have a bottom level navigation and when the user is going to be ready for this because sometimes they may just not recognize these things in, on websites because they're not used to this. This is a great learning from Matalan, British homeware and fashion retailer. They decided to test whether an app-like navigation approach is going to increase the number of engagements with the elements in the panel. They wanted to improve product findability and the number of engagements with the navigation panel in general. An A-B test revealed very surprising results. They did increase the number of uh, engagements with the basket icon, which was a good thing, and they did want this. However, the number of engagements with other elements in the panel has decreased, and they rolled it all back to the top level navigation. So again, as with everything that we speak here today, do test these things. I'm really excited about the bottom level navigation, because again, the, in mobile, it makes a lot more sense but users are also need to be ready for this change, and you need to test what kind of things work better for your target audience. What else about navigation? Call to actions are a part of navigation, and if you have just, for example, one thing that you want people to do on your website right now in this page, then it is a good idea to have this one call to action also stick it to the bottom, right? This is the way how you make people always aware what is that next thing that they need to do. And also, again, it's just quite easy to tap on mobile. It's, it's on the bottom. Um, and then also, if you want people just to do one thing, then navigation doesn't always have to be present. There is so-called rule of noise that I'm going to reference here, and it's when users are really close to conversion then you may remove all unnecessary navigation, all distractions, all exit points. Does anybody in the room speak Russian language? Yeah. Uh, so then you can confirm that this is a basket page. Right? This is a basket page of a large consumer electronics um, retailer in video. And what they did, they redesigned their basket page. So first of all, they removed the navigation panel completely, and including the hamburger button, the search and basket icon. And in general, they implemented a bit cleaner design. So all in all, they 
they removed the noise, right? The, the, the rule is called the rule of noise. And what they found that the average order value and the conversion rate has increased. So they were now telling users, okay, what is that one next thing that you need to do, right? You, can, you could still go back, like the blue hyperlink on the bottom is the way you're coming back to the product detail page or whatever you were, but it was now just much more clear that, okay, I'm in the basket and the next thing is to check out for me. So do remember these things about the navigation. It, it is a good idea to test the bottom level navigation bar uh, and including the just sticking kick call to actions to the bottom. And also when users are really close to conversion, and they're ready to commit, then it is a good idea to limit the exit points. The next thing here, and I don't have a real life example, unfortunately, but let's speak a bit about the landing page design. And I already spoke a bit about the value proposition, but now I'm just going to reference so-called the rule of three elements above the fold. So for any single landing page, any home page, any website, any industry, it is a good idea to always have three elements and do this kind of five second check. Okay, do I have them all, right? So the first one is the value proposition, is the message that you are telling to the user, okay, what, you, the, what they can do there, what kind of your business sells. It's the call to action, what is the thing that you want them to do now, and it kind of always have to be above the fold and it's some visuals. The visuals is something that often gets underestimated, especially in some, I don't know, hardcore industries, in, in finance, in um, uh, tech B2B. However, visuals are a very strong signal to our brain because we are all human beings. We learned how to read maybe like at the age of five, but the visuals is something that our brain is recognizing instantly. The, first second when you land and it helps us to recall things and to make some sometimes even emotional connections to them. That's how you illustrate your value proposition too. Okay, so it looks like these guys are all doing great. <laughs> they, they've got all three elements above the fold. But is there still anything wrong that you can spot? That's my question. So all good. Right, a good landing page. Well, it is a good landing page, but I have a question. Does this page continue? Do you think there is something else there? Well, the problem is that we don't know, right? We kind of, it doesn't look like it continues, but it actually does, and they have benefits of signing up for Google Ads there. Very important information, very well written, but nobody's ever gonna see it because people will have no idea they need to scroll down. Which brings us to the next point, breaking the fold. Designing above the fold space in a way that you tell people who land that there is something else below and they need to scroll down in order to figure out what that is. And I'm happy to share a brilliant case study from 100 Rooms. This is a hotel search aggregator in Spain. So they redesigned their hotel listing page in a way that, first of all, they broke the fold, right? Uh, on the screenshot after, you can see that the page really looks like a hotel listing page and not a page with just one hotel option. And the second thing that they did, do you remember what we spoke before about not rushing the user into commitment just yet? So they removed this huge call to action reserve with TripAdvisor uh, because they realized it's just too early for users to commit at this stage to make the decision to reserve from just scrolling through the list of hotels. And they changed it to view offer and add to favorites. As a result of all these changes, the final conversion rate has increased by more than 50%. The last thing I'm going to speak about in the test section is the forms. And in general, you may read some articles about making forms simple, painless, you know, as short as possible. That's absolutely the case when, for example, form is the last thing that users face on their way to the purchase. 
However, if you have forms somewhere up the funnel, for example, on the landing page, then really short forms asking about some personal information, like email address, they may really freak people out. So what you can try, if, for example, you are a lead generation website and you have forms on your landing pages, you can experiment with so-called breadcrumbs technique. This is a technique when you actually increase the number of fields, but you break the form into steps. And before asking some so-called high-threat questions like sensitive information, you uh, use this email address, their phone number, you introduce so-called low-threat questions. What are your business goals? How we can help you? What do you want to learn about us? And then after they're already halfway through, they already filled out some information, you're saying, saying, okay, now we need just to send it to you somewhere, give us your email address, and that's how you kind of resolve the anxiety that people can have. This is a great case study from Reich team. They do project management software, and this is a desktop product. So the goal of mobile landings for them is just completely lead generation. And they were comparing a very short page on the left-hand side, which did not have any navigation. It's just simply a value proposition and a call to action. Give us your email address and register. And the other page, which was longer, and it had much more content, but the user could only access the content after they complete the short questionnaire in the top. Just let me wait. For example, they had to choose the role and what they want to learn about the product. For example, I'm a marketeer and I want to see how Rike can help my team to be more efficient. And then you get redirected to relevant section of the page. So what they found was that the conversion rate was higher from the short page, right? It's a very straightforward one. I can do nothing else there but just to leave my email address and click the button. However, the quality of leads that they were getting was higher from the second page because users who engaged with the content, who found some answers to their specific questions, they just expressed much more interest in buying their product later on. So at the end of the day, it's not only just about like, conversion rate optimization, it's also about the quality of, lead, of, the, of these conversions, quality of leads that your sales team is going to get right, and going to be working with. And it's about the revenue of your company that you're, you're looking at. So that's the thing about forms. You can try to make them work for you, right? You can experiment with the length of forms and try to in them make forms engage the user. Okay, we are done with the test part, and this is a, again, checklist of things uh, for, for now. If you came here for, for, for this thing, you can just now take a picture or check it on the website later. So what's now, right? Are we done with improving user experience, improving conversion optimization? Is it as easy as just to go for all of you and test these things? No. And what we are seeing, what's happening in mobile space and specifically on websites and A-B testing and conversion rate optimization processes that people have in the companies, it's not as easy as just to go and do these things, right? There is much more than that, and you all know this, and we recognize uh, the importance of looking at, into other areas. So what are the other areas? This is a research from Conversion Excel. Um, it's a, like a great website uh, for all um, brilliant ideas for conversion rate optimization, A-B testing, and analytics. So they say that A-B testing is only 20% of your conversion rate optimization process. What else is really there? Right? What, what, what do we spend time on? Okay, 20% of your time you do spend on running tests. Developing tests, designing, running them, reporting. About 20% of your time, so just about the same amount, you spend on looking into data, trying to analyze it, understand, and just to get insights, 
data of your current website, like some Google Analytics data or results of previous A-B tests, and you just, because you need to make hypotheses, right? Um, and what's the rest 60%? What is this huge gray area, you know? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's a internal politics that we all need to deal with, unfortunately, right? It's talking to other people and making them work with you on the same stuff. So, no, it's not as easy as just to kind of go and test these things. And while we are providing people with all these checklists, you know, you need to go and test that, we realize it's, it's much more than that. So what are the key problems, right? Let's maybe have a quick look into the section about the understanding data, trying to get insights. Now, the problem here is that, first of all, people um, look into data and they see different things. I'm going to stay very high level on this section because I'm not measurement expert. There are a lot of other measurement experts in the industry and I'm going to refer to a channel uh, called Conversions at Google. This is a conference that we host annually in Dublin and it's all about websites, UX optimization and conversions optimization. So there here are brilliant speakers talking about uh, how you can look into data in Google Optimize, Google Analytics, and to really make use of it to get insights. And the next uh, talk by Mete, by my colleague, it's actually going to get uploaded just this week, the next week. So what, what is happening, right? The problem is that people, they kind of say things like, statistical significance, conversion rates, but they measure them differently. They mean different things under them, and we, we sometimes they just don't know what they do, how to measure things. We see that measurement is a real, real struggle, and we realize that, okay, we need to really come up with some sort of universal standards. But in fact, in order to really excel at A-B testing and excel in understanding what's going on on your website, you need to learn hardcore statistics at your best, you need to become one of the best experts in the industry because even highly trained statisticians make mistakes when they look into data. And the reason why we're all making mistakes is because we're all human beings and we want to prove our own ideas work. We have our own biases and when we create a, when we have an idea for an A-B test, right, or maybe like the um, navigation bar is going to go work better, we want to see that our baby wins. We want to see a positive outcome from an A-B test, and that is a real problem because the, it's not the right approach. The, uh, you need to really learn how to celebrate failed A-B tests Right? As an example with Edgar's, when they changed the sale to deals, like the whole thing failed. You need to celebrate failed A-B test because if A-B test fails, then it was a good idea to, to launch this A-B test. So the point of the conversion optimization is to learn and not to win, not to prove your own ideas are great. So do invest in, into your own knowledge of statistics and data, measurement, but try at the same time to be humble. Try to be aware of your own bias because that's kind of what makes all things fail in general, right? You need to learn how to celebrate mistakes and how to celebrate failures because the next thing is gonna go in to do these failures on a constant basis and to learn from these failures uh, as a company, right? So, and in order to do that, you probably need to change your own mindset, but also change the mindset of people around you, which brings us to the next thing, to the, you know, the internal politics, managing projects, and just talking to people. We do spend a lot of time on talking to other people, and like you know, the study says it's about 60%. Uh, and the reason why we spend so much time on these things, about talking about what we test and how we test, is probably because we're very inefficient in this process and we haven't, haven't agreed on the basics. So w what we can do there, right? We should probably change the culture, the mindset of people around, and this is a very complex area, 
right? Uh, but this is something that we started realizing is the major barrier to why things are not happening, why user experiences on our websites is still not super great. When we speak to UX designers, you know, they always agree with us. They say, yeah, we know it's, it's good for the user. But, you know, we also have really our marketing department, and they said we need to have this carousel of banners on our homepage because they have some partnerships in place, and they said that all these partnerships need to be featured in the same amount of time, of user time. So, sorry, we cannot really do anything about this. We just need to have this carousel there. So, it looks like UX excellence, it's not only UX designer's job, it's not only UX designer's responsibility, there are a lot more stakeholders involved, and uh, you know, we really need to have a look at all, all the stakeholders, what's going on, let's just do a quick map. So, in fact, in the reality, all departments in the company would have different KPIs, different priorities, and it's going to result into some internal clashing, right? So well, what can happen, right? The product people, UX people may think they know best what's, for the user, what's good for the user, right? They, sometimes you can even have uh, people in product who think that it's their job to define product vision and changes, so-called Steve Jobs effect. And there you go, you have 1 p.m. translating their ideas to everyone else in the company and uh, not listening to anyone else to feedback. Marketing, as we have already learned, they sometimes make care only about the number of leads, not only about um, just about the quality of leads, which will eventually result into sales inefficiency. Right? Well, developers, all clear, they're always busy, and it's so hard to get their attention, to get your feature um, into the, their pipeline. Uh, customer support, they're not even on the slide because nobody just listens to them, everybody forgets customer support, but they are designed to bury all bugs, right, under a good CSAT, just to bring a good CSAT to the sea level. And the sea level, they, will, may, they just may not even be aware of these things and challenges and struggles. So, how do we go, really go about these changes? How do we uh, improve the way we speak to each other. We definitely need to speak to each other better. And so, for example, product and UX, they need to realize that they are not necessarily voice of the user. Sales or customer support, you need to include them into the whole process because they speak to your users on a daily basis. So probably what you should be doing, you should go to the best salesperson in your company and talk to them, and they will have very good points for you. You will learn a lot more about your users from them. Right? And uh, marketing, though, well, they definitely need to collaborate with a product a lot more and listen to them, and it's just the other way around. In fact, you should become, like again, whatever job title you have, you should become the advocate of this agile culture where it's okay to fail constantly to, and then to learn from these failures. You need to sell this idea to the C-level, to your boss, because if, if you get their buy-in, then things are going to get just much more easier. But also you need to sell it to everyone else, so it's kind of a shared journey that you're going to, and it's not that easy to become agile just like tomorrow, right? It's really a process that you need to go through. But you need to find allies uh, of this idea, and you will have to probably start from scratch, well, if you are not yet agile, but there is some sort of a candy to everyone in this world, and you need to speak to people and find, find out what is that benefit. Okay, what are the practical things that you can try in order to achieve this, right? One of the things that you can try is adopt design thinking methods, because they will allow you to achieve both at the same time, to learn fast and to get everyone in the room. One of the things that we do on my team, we run design sprints for companies. And design sprint, raise your hand if you have ever done any type of design sprint, if you've gone through this. 
Okay, then uh, it's quite new for you, and you can read about the, um, how to do design sprints in the book by Jake Knapp. So design sprints is a methodology of applying design thinking into solving critical business problems, and you can apply it to solving any, anything, right? Any problem. On my team, we apply it to solving UI problems and to launching changes in mobile websites fast. So the first concept of getting feedback at the very early stage, right, the learning fast thing, allows you to fail cheaply and in low fidelity. The second thing about divergent and conversion thinking, uh, about opening up to all opportunities and possibilities and closing, choosing the one that you want to focus on, allows you not only to explore the new terrain, explore new solutions, but also to really get everyone in the room and build the confidence behind the team on what you want to achieve. Again, you can learn about these uh, things in the different YouTube videos by Jake Knapp or his book. And just to give you an encouraging example, uh, this is a, one of the last sprints that my team has run was in South Africa. And uh, we took different companies from, uh, through best practices of landing page design and we ask them to prototype in the afternoon. So within just one day, One Life, an insurance company in South Africa, they completely redesigned one of their landings. And as you can see, it, was, it's, it became quite different. They uh, impl implemented very short and concise form, which allowed to bring the key call to action above the fold. They implemented value proposition in two key bullet points, nice and concise and visual. They improved the image layout. They fixed the header on the top, and they fixed key call to actions in that header. So the, the new version completely killed the other one, like right? plus 65 to conversions. And they said, you know, we were well aware of these best practices because we spoke to them before, but they said we never really got to do this. But Design Sprint allowed us, uh, they brought their agency, their in-house teams, designers, really different people, and the Design Sprint allowed them to really sit together and to agree that these changes are necessary and to launch an A-B test just in about two weeks and see that it, it was really winning. Another example, again, so just to kind of give you a perspective of different websites and different industries, Edgar's is a large South African omnichannel fashion retailer, and at that design sprint, they redesigned their homepage, which for any retailer is a huge thing to do, you know, but they actually, again, they agreed as a team that these changes are necessary. They removed the animated carousel. They implemented the high-level high categories above the fold, so it was immediately clear what is this, you know, the range of things that you sell. And they also implemented the value proposition above the fold, too, information about the free delivery and some other benefits. So as a result, the conversion rate increased and uh, the revenue per visitor too. But the biggest change for Edgar specifically was that they actually used to be quite a traditional retailer and uh, most of their sales were coming from offline. But improving their website experience allowed to get more online sales and now they're doing heavy A-B testing and um, um, with, with Google Optimize. So what uh, basically happened is that their product department, their digital department has introduced requirements to merchandising process. They optimized the whole value chain because it, it was affecting the digital experience uh, on the website. And that's how their product, their digital department, is trying to change the culture of people around, of, outside of digital, and to make everyone accountable. I will finish the change part with this quote. Product excellence is a culture. Unfortunately, it's not a checklist that I can share with you. It's really about shared responsibility, about taking pride about the work that you do, taking pride of contributing to a great product, contributing to a great company, and really making everyone accountable. So in order to really achieve this culture, you need to change the mindset of your, your own mindset and the mindset of people around. So remember 
the example of the salt and pepper shaker from London, right? Let, let's assume that designer did want the salt to be in the shaker with five holes, as I expected this, as the end user expected. Let's imagine this. But maybe it was implementation that failed. Maybe it was a kitchen assistant who just put salt into a wrong shaker because they didn't connect the designer of the original idea, or in general, they didn't care about the end customer experience that much. So that's why I got really bad user experience and they never want to go back to that restaurant. So I want to conclude my talk with just these key points, right? First one is do this, ch test this, checklists, um, study best practices, because these are really great ideas that worked for other companies, but you need to really be careful and A-B test these things, because what works well for one um, company, one website, may not exactly be the case for your target audience, your design, or your business model. The next one is do learn statistics as much as you can, but try at the same time to stay humble and uh, be aware of your own bias, how your bias is affecting the process. And uh, try to learn how to celebrate mistakes. Be very you know, humble, learn from failures, because the next thing is to go and learn from these failures on a daily basis, and that's kind of how you, uh, kind of the environment that will allow you to do it is a agile environment, and in order to achieve agile um, culture, you need to really change, uh, work on this, work on speaking to other people. And you know, organizational change is a very large and complex area. No one can give you a solution of, uh, to this in to just five bullet points, but that's why we all need to start working on this right now and make this our biggest goal, because that's one of the major barriers that we saw why things are not happening. Become the advocate of testing an agile culture and make this the biggest goal for you. Thank you.